you'd welcome Dr. Alistair McGrath. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here this morning. And let me apologize for the change in accent. My theme today is science and faith, but it's more than that. It's really about how our faith makes sense of things and how we can really rejoice in the big picture that our Christian faith gives us of our world, of ourselves, and helps us understand how we fit things in, make sense of ourselves, and build a vision for who we are and the difference that we can make in the world. And so I want to begin this by telling you something of my own story. Because when I was a young man in my teens, I was a very aggressive atheist. I was studying sciences at high school. And it seemed absolutely clear to me, as a 16-year-old, that science, in effect, explained everything. That there was no need for a God. In fact, there was no conceptual space for a God, because science was able to explain everything. Now, I know that probably sounds very naive, but I was 16 at the time, and it just seemed to me to be very, very obviously right. In fact, these days, when I read people like Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins, I get all nostalgic because that's the way I used to be when I was 16. <laughs> so anyway, I went up to Oxford to study science in much more detail, and I was expecting to find my atheism confirmed. But in one of those remarkable turnarounds, something very different happened. I began to realize two things. First of all, that atheism wasn't as intellectually resilient as I had thought. It was, in fact, a faith. I could not prove that there was no God. And it really just began to come home to me. This wasn't something that was secure, as safe as I had thought it was. And I began to talk to my Christian friends, many of whom were studying the sciences, and I began to realize that Christianity seemed to have something going for it. It had a depth, it had an integrity, which I simply hadn't appreciated myself. And to cut a long story short, I gave up on atheism and embraced Christianity. And I've never really looked back on that momentous decision. Why is that? Well, I think it's partly because of this insight that Christianity gives us a way of seeing things, a way of making sense of things. And for me, that's very important. It's like a lens that brings our experience, that brings our observation into focus. So that what seems to be blurry actually is only blurry because we're not seeing it in the right way. And that seems to me to be a very important point to make. So let me move on and make another point now. And what I want to do is, we just have the next slide, please. Um, make the point that faith is not something which is about running away from reality. When I moved from atheism to Christianity, I was not saying, hey, I'm giving up on solid fact and I'm embracing some kind of fantasy. No. It was having thought this through, having reflected on the evidence, this was the way ahead. It was an informed, principled decision. Christianity makes far more sense. The evidence is better. And of course, I need to make the point that faith is something that can be trusted, even though it can't always be proved. And I go, again, I go back to the point I made a moment ago. I realized that when I was an atheist, I was someone who believed that there was no God, but I knew I couldn't prove that. Now, I'm a Christian who believes passionately that there is a God and knows the life-changing difference that this makes. I can't prove that to be true. You can prove things in logic or mathematics, but in all the really big questions of life, the questions that really matter to me and to you, we find that we embrace things believing they're right and trusting they're right and knowing they make a difference, 
but not being able to prove them absolutely 100%. That's just the way things are. And I very often come back to this quote from a British cultural critic, Terry Eagleton, who says, we hold many beliefs that have no unimpeachably rational justification, but are nonetheless reasonable to entertain. So just to translate that into ordinary English, um, what he's saying is, look, we believe lots of stuff that we can't prove, but we know we're right in holding on to this because it makes a difference. Let's move on to our next slide. Because of the point here I want to make, and a Spanish philosopher makes this point really, really well. Remember, I was a scientist, and I loved science. I still love science. And my question was, is science going to be something I have to leave behind? Or is there some way of fitting it in to this bigger picture? And this Spanish philosopher makes this point well. Scientific truth, he says, is characterized by its precision, by the certainty of its predictions. He's right. But science achieves these admirable qualities at the cost of remaining on the level of secondary concerns, leaving ultimate and decisive questions untouched. In other words, it's really good at asking questions of how do things work? How do our bodies work? How does this universe work? But when it comes to big questions, why am I here? What is the point of life? How do I lead the good life? Then it doesn't help. We need something else to help us here. And he writes, we're given no escape from these ultimate questions. In one way or another, they're in us, whether we like it or not. And look at this brilliant quote. Scientific truth is exact, but it is incomplete. Hold on to that thought. Because I'm not saying science is bad. I'm saying it really helps us. It fills in part of our big picture of life. But there are other bits of that picture it cannot fill in. And that is why Christianity is so wonderful. Because it gives us this extra layer of interpretation. This realization that this bigger picture can be filled in with meaning, with beauty, with value, with purpose. And science doesn't really do those things. And that seems to me it's very important. Now, I like the poetry of John Donne. Uh, he was a 17th century English poet. And in a, uh, a poem of seven, 1611, he was reflecting on the way the world seemed to be completely disconnected. Tis all in pieces, he wrote, all coherence gone. What's he worried about? He's worried about the fact that it seems to him that life is simply little isolated compartments that are disconnected. And he was wondering, is there some way we can reconnect all these things and hold them together? And I want to say to you that is one of the great strengths of the Christian faith. It gives us this picture, this framework, this way of weaving individual threads together so that suddenly we see the pattern that they disclose. It's about being able to hold things together in a unified whole. And that really is very important for a lot of people. We need a bigger picture to make sense of our life. And let's look at Sir Peter Medawar. He was a British biologist. He was a rationalist, didn't really like religion very much, but knew it had something very important to say. And look at this quote in which he's talking about the distinctiveness of human beings. Only humans, he writes, find their way by a light that illuminates more than the patch of ground they stand on. That's a good little quote, because it's saying that we want to see the bigger picture. We want to know not just what lies six feet ahead of us, but rather where we're going in life. What is life all about? Why are we here? Can I make a difference? And I'm sure you've all asked those questions, and they're important. So how do we begin to answer them? Mary Midgley, as you can see from this, is a 
a rather elderly British philosopher. She's in her 90s. But she's formidable and says some wonderful things. Here's one of them. For most important questions in human life, a number of different conceptual toolboxes always have to be used together. And what she is saying here is that science is good, but it's limited. It gives a toolbox that's really helpful in thinking about how things work, but it doesn't answer those deeper questions about value and meaning. We need to bring another toolbox in to answer those questions. And what I began to realize is that science was part of a big picture, but the Christian faith is central. It's there. It gives us our bearings. It helps us to make sense of these things. Now, obviously, as I was thinking these things through, I found I needed role models. One of them was C.S. Lewis, who I found helpful then and still do. But another was this man, Charles Coulson, who was Oxford's first professor of theoretical chemistry. He was a Methodist lay preacher, and he thought about his faith. And he came to the conclusion that you could make sense of the relationship of science and faith by saying they're each different perspectives on life. And we rely on this perspective at some times and this perspective at others. And in his book, Science and Christian Belief, he made some really important points. He says, look, we don't believe in a God of the gaps, as if we have to rely on what science can't explain to prove the existence of God. No, he said, God is not there in the gaps. God is there in the fact that we can make sense of things in the first place. God is the one who gives us this big picture, which makes sense of our world and makes sense of of the natural sciences. It helps us to understand why they work, but more importantly, it also helps us understand what their limits are, that there are certain things that they just can't do. And so for Coulson, we're talking about different perspectives. Science gives us one perspective, that's great, part of the picture. And the Christian faith gives us another perspective, and we need both. Now, Coulson was a mountaineer, and one of the mountains he loved climbing was the Scottish mountain, Ben Nevis. And so I'm going to show you a photograph of Ben Nevis. It's a very unusual photograph because it's Ben Nevis on a good day. (laughs) Uh, And while you're looking at this, uh, Coulson says, look, Ben Nevis is a complex thing. If you look at it from different angles, you see different things. And the point he makes is this. There are different perspectives on this mountain. What you've got to do is find some way of bringing all these perspectives together. He writes, a partial knowledge can be supplemented by sharing with others in the descriptions which they give us. And then he criticizes scientists who say, science has all the answers. We don't need to talk to anybody else. Coulson says... It's only the man who cannot or will not look at it from more than one viewpoint who claims an exclusive authority for his own position. So you can see there almost Charles Coulson anticipating what Sam Harris, what Richard Dawkins said, and giving us a framework that says, no, no, there is science that tells us some things, there is our faith which talks about other things, and we can bring these together to give a richer and deeper understanding of reality. Now, let me just tell you one story about Charles Coulson before we go back to Mary Midgley. There is another Chuck Coulson that you know very well about here in the United States. Uh, And I was giving a lecture in Oxford about uh, 10 years ago on this Charles Coulson, And we got a very big audience. We were very pleased, and it was mainly Americans. Uh, And afterwards, they came up to me and said, well, it wasn't the Chuck Coulson we were expecting, but it, it was quite interesting. But anyway, back to Mary Midgley. Midgley says, we need multiple maps of reality. That's a good phrase. It's a good image. You need faith, 
You need science and you need others as well. The arts, you know, you've, lots of other stuff could go in there as well. But the point she is making is that we need these different maps of reality to try and make sense of things. And as Christians, that makes perfect sense. One map tells us how things work. Another map tells us what they mean. Science gives a map of functionality, but the Christian faith gives us this map of meaning, of value, of purpose, of significance. And that is really important. And to try and illustrate this point, she says, try and imagine you're looking at a big aquarium. And she says, look, if you're looking at this aquarium, it's complex. So here's what she says about this aquarium. She says, we cannot see it as a whole from above, so we peer in at it through a number of small windows. We can eventually make quite a lot of sense of this habitat if we patiently put together the data from different angles. But if we insist our own window is the only one worth looking through, we shall not get very far. That's Sam Harris, that's Richard Dawkins. Our window is the only window. I'm sorry, it's not. There are others and they enrich, they amplify this. Richard Dawkins would say, well, when, when we use a scientific window, we see no sign of any purpose or meaning or value whatsoever. Maybe that's true, but there are other windows we look through, including the Christian faith, which gives us this rich and deep and satisfying understanding of who we are, what our world is all about, and what we can do in this world for God. So that, I think, is very important. So, perspectives. Science gives one perspective. Faith gives a different perspective. Put them together, you get a deeper and richer perspective. It's like trying to describe this wonderful, um, this wonderful church. You know, you have a wonderful building here. They look different from different angles. Put them all together, you get the true vision of what it looks like. But another way of thinking about it is not so much science and faith as different perspectives, as science and faith as different levels of reality or different levels of explanation. What do I mean? I mean that when you're dealing with a very complex reality, you think about having different layers and science engages one layer, our faith another. Let me give you an example from Frank Rhodes. Frank Rhodes is not someone you'll have heard of, but he is a well-known British geologist who went on to become president of Cornell University in the 1990s. And he says, I want you to imagine that you've put a kettle on to boil. Here's his question. Why is that kettle boiling. He gives two answers. Answer number one, because we're talking about conversion of energy. Electricity is converted into heat. That brings the water to boiling point. That is a scientific explanation of why the kettle is boiling. But there's another explanation. And remember, Frank Rhodes was British, and he wanted to make himself a cup of tea. So he put the kettle on. Now, here's the point I want to make. Once you see this point, everything will look different. Energy conversion, wanting a cup of tea, two very different explanations, but can you see that the fact that the first is right doesn't make the second wrong? And the fact that the second is right doesn't make the first wrong. It means that you put them together and you get a richer and deeper explanation of why that kettle was boiling. Similarly, Rhodes says, science and faith are different ways of thinking about our world. They engage different levels. The scientists would now say, well, the universe came into existence in the Big Bang. We're not quite sure how that happened, but it certainly did happen. The Christian will say, well, we're talking about creation, God bringing things into existence. Different levels, but they're talking about the same thing, and they enrich each other. So let's move on then and look at another point that I think is very important to make here. And the point I'm going to make here is we need to resist 
reductionism. Very often people will say, look, you know, human beings are just metabolic processing machines, or they're just atoms and molecules. And that's all that there is to be said. But what I want to say is this. Yes, you and I are made up of atoms and molecules. But there is so much more that needs to be said. So many other layers of interpretation. I'm holding up here a piece of paper. And it's very exciting. It tells me when I must stop preaching. <laughs> but look, it is made of atoms and molecules. I'm made of atoms and molecules, and so are every one of you. And if you and I are on the same level of this piece of paper, we are in a very bad place. The point I'm making is simple. Yes, we are made of atoms and molecules, but that's only a starting point for a very important conversation. And for Christians, one of the most distinctive things is not that we're made of atoms and molecules, but that we are made to relate to a loving and living God who treasures us and has something special he wants each of us to do. And it seems to me that is a really important point to bring out. The fact that we are made by a loving and living God who wants us to do certain things for him. So let's move on and look at another point here. And the point I'm going to make in a moment is coming back to Sir Peter Medua, who I mentioned earlier, again, not a religious person, but very much aware of the limits of science. And for us, people like Richard Dawkins would say, well, science can answer all the questions. Medua is saying, no, it can't. There are questions that science cannot answer and that no conceivable advance of science would empower it to answer. And I want to say to you that's a really important point. I love science, but if you love something or someone, you still are aware of their limits. You're not idealistic. You say, I love them from what they are, but I realize that there are certain things that they are not, and science doesn't answer those big questions that the philosopher Karl Popper called ultimate questions. Ultimate questions. Why are we here? What is our purpose in life? Science is very good at telling us how we came to be here, but it doesn't tell us why we are here. We need to get that vision from somewhere else. And the point I'm making through Medua is that the Christian faith gives you answers to those ultimate questions. It helps us understand why science works, but it also enables us to see it has its limits. And Christianity is able to meet those absences by providing this rich moral vision of ourselves and our world. So let's move on because another point I want to make is this. You remember I've been emphasizing this point about the importance of meaning, the importance of significance. And throughout this service, we've been focusing on Psalm 8. It's a wonderful psalm. It invites us to reflect on the magnificence of a starry sky at night and appreciate how small we are. But the point is, that even though the universe is vast, we still matter to that loving God who made each of us and knows us by name. And one of the great joys of the Christian faith is that we are dealing with a God who gives meaning who brings joy, who bestows significance on each and every one of us. And that, it seems to me, is something that is really very important. It's all about this realization that each of us matter. That's not something that science says. Science, in effect, treats us as just individual examples of a broader phenomenon, as individuals, we don't really matter. But for our God and for our gospel, we really 
do matter. So let me ask you to imagine with Carl Sagan what he called the pale blue dot. What does he mean by that? Well, let me tell you. The space probe Voyager was launched many years ago to explore the outer realms of the solar system, and it sent back some astonishing images of Jupiter and Saturn, which you can still see and marvel at. But at one point, NASA turned the camera backward, so you could see where it was coming from, not where it was going to. And in that picture of a pale blue dot, there is a black, a, a black picture with one pixel, which is pale blue. And that's us. And Carl Sagan describes this as a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. Here's what I want to say to you. Yes, that picture brings home to us even more the vastness of our universe. But it still speaks to us of a God who made our universe and us, and that we are significant. We really matter to him. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? And then the psalm simply makes the point God made us, God knows us, God names us. And I want you to hold that in your heart. Let me stand back as I wrap up, because I want just to bring some things together. The all-important thing is this. I think science is great, but it has its limits, and I have no time for those who pretend it does not have those limits. There are questions it can't answer, and they are big questions. Questions of morals, questions of identity, and above all, individual meaning and purpose. And you and I need those answers. And the Christian faith delivers on those powerfully and meaningfully. And I've often found myself coming back to C.S. Lewis. And you remember, earlier in the sermon, I touched on him very, very briefly. He's someone I began to read about uh, two years after I was converted. And he's one of these guys who, once I started reading him, I kept coming back to him. Because what I find about Lewis is you read him, you come back later and read him again, and you see something you missed the first time round. And he's one of my intellectual and spiritual traveling companions through life. But here's a quote he gives us towards the end of a lecture at Oxford in the year 1945. I'm going to read this to you because I think it's very helpful. I believe in Christianity, he writes, as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And to me, that is why Lewis became a Christian and stayed a Christian. And I find myself resonating very strongly with what that quotation says. I want you, as we come to a close, to use your imaginations. You are standing on a mountaintop before dawn and you're looking down on a landscape. It is dark. It's enveloped in shadows and mist. You can't really see anything. And then the sun begins to rise, and the shadows begin to disappear. The mist begins to be burned off, and you see more clearly, you see further than you otherwise could do. For Lewis, that's what Christianity does. It gives you this way of seeing our world. And sure, Lewis is clear there are always patches of mist that remain. There are things covered in shadow we don't really fully understand. But there's something here that really enables us to live meaningfully in the world. So as I end, my point simply is this. Yep, science is great, but we need more than that. And that's true of so many other things as well, the humanities, the arts, 
Christianity gives us this big picture which reassures every one of us here this morning that even though this universe is vast, we matter to God. There is something God wants us to do, and part of our task as Christians is to discover that as we do. In a moment, we'll be singing about the greatness of that God, but as I close the sermon, my point is very simply this. This is a God who is to be trusted, and this is a God who cares for each of us and has something he wants each of us to do. Let me close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have redeemed us, that you love us, that you've placed us in this world. And Lord, help us never to lose sight of your love for us and to find a way of responding to that love by finding what you want us to do and doing it in your world to honor your name and proclaim your gospel. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.